I was trying to get in 15 minutes ago, nobody, I don't know, some confusion here today. Anyway, now we're starting a little late. Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nalu Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar, Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. So we'll welcome everyone to our ongoing study of Bhakti Vai Bhav. We're on Unit 1. And we're studying Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, second chapter, and also third chapter. Okay, can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes, yes Maharaj. Yes, 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 Oh, good. Okay, this is lesson four. Review, lesson three. All right, uh, what did we study in the last class? We'll have a look briefly what we went over, we saw. Hmm. Quotes from verses in the second chapter from 6 to number 11, which we considered most useful in preaching. Were you able to select some quotes from there? They are important verses. For example, verse number 6 answers the first question of the sages about what is the ultimate good for all people. And that verse describes the supreme occupation for all humanity and so on. And then verse number 7 answers the second question, what was the essence of all scriptures? And the essence was described that uh, by performing devotional service, we automatically develop causeless knowledge and detachment from the world. So that was the answer to the second question. Then text number 11 is also a very important verse, describes the nature of the Absolute Truth. Vadanti tat tatvam vidam tatvam yajnanam abhayam brahmati paramatmati bhagavan iti shabhyate Learned transcendentalists who know the absolute truth call this non-dual substance as brahman, paramatma and bhagavan. So uh, these are certainly major quote, important quotations in preaching Krishna consciousness. Some of you may like to add more. You may have taken some quotes from Prabhupada's purports. I don't know. Anyone like to contribute? Did you pick up anything? Have you marked anything? No volunteers? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes? Uh, I considered from 2.9 uh, dharmasya hi apavagrasya, that is uh, occupational duties for ultimate liberation and not for material gain or sense uh, gratification. Yes, right. Good. That's a very important verse. Very nice. Well done. Yes. Another verse, Maharaji, is verse number 8, that is uh, uh, occupation, uh, uh, dharmasya, swa, pista, pun, swa, occupational duty are 
only useless flavor if they are not provoked attraction for the Lord's messages. Yes, good. Useless flavor. Shrama eva hi kevalam. If we don't develop our attraction for Krishna, it's just useless labor. All right, fine, thank you. And then, second point from lesson three, the standard of first class transcendental religion with reference to the second chapter, verses six and seven. What is the standard of first class transcendental religion? Anyone? Understand this? Pro Dharma Maharaj. Huh? Paro Dharma. Supreme Dharma, the supreme religion. Yeah, what is that supreme religion then? Maharaj, in one of the PowerPoints you showed, it was mentioned, Prabhupada mentioning that first class religion is which teaches us how to render service to the supreme personality of Godhead. So, in the PPT that you shared last time, Yes. Um, the first class religion was which teaches us how to render service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And also in um, 1.2.8, Prabhupada writes in his purport that because foolish people have no information of the soul and how it is beyond the purview of the body and mind, they are not satisfied in performance of their occupational duties. So, like, um, it mentions that uh, it has to invoke, you know, the uh, detachment from all of this and uh, attachment towards the service, towards the Supreme Society of Godhead. Yes, very good, very nice. Yes, anything more? Mara should develop love for God. Yes, very good, very important. Prem Punartu Mahan, the goal of life is to develop, develop love of God. So first class transcendental religion must be pleasing to the Lord, it must be pleasing to Him. We want to do service in a manner which is pleasing to Him. And that service should be, if we want to please Him, it should be ahaitaki and apratihata. Right? Meaning? What's the meaning ahaitaki and apratihata? Sir, unmotivated. Yes, unmotivated and? Uninterrupted. And uninterrupted, right. These two qualities are important in first class transcendental religion. Not kite of a dharma, right? Everyone's cheating religion. They're all concerned with their sense gratification. Although, okay, then we went on to discuss the importance of occupational duties and Krishna Consciousness with specific reference to congregational application, <laughs> right? Remember we spoke about this student, the young boy, he's studying to be a doctor and he reads in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it's all useless labor. Mm, so, uh, congregational application, you know, people in the congregation, they're going to apply it in their way, uh, you know, people are, who are more uh, like in Krishna Consciousness, more committed in Krishna Consciousness, they will apply it in a different way. And so congregation, our, our movement has changed over the years and Prabhupada's time it was definitely all ashram based and today it's much more congregation based. And so there are some big differences there in our application of the teachings. So we have to understand how to apply, how to implement the, the teachings of Krishna Consciousness according to the time and circumstances, the situation. It's not going to be the same for everyone. For people in the congregation, they'll take it one way, and for people who are full-time devotees, they'll take it in a different way. So, occupational duties. And Krishna Consciousness, we have to understand how to apply these things in different situations, all right? Is everyone okay with that? Can we go on? Okay, we'll go on to hear about chapter 3, that Krishna is the source of all incarnations. And the first five verses describe the roles of the Purusha avatars in the creation. 
right? Who are the Purusha avatars? Someone? Yes, right. right. Karano Dakshai Vishnu or Maha Vishnu, who is laying in the Kashyo ocean. And he's the cause of the initial cause of the creation of the material world. So you have the three Vish Purusha avatars, Vishnu, all forms of Vishnu, and uh, one is there in the Karana Ocean, Karana Dakshayi, the Kajyo Ocean, that's Mahavishnu, Karana Dakshayi Vishnu. And from the body of Mahavishnu, the universes are coming out. One breath of Mahavishnu and all the universes come out from the skin pores of Mahavishnu. And then the Lord, Lord Mahavishnu, expands himself into each of these universes, and he is known as Garbhodakashayi Vishnu. He enters into each of these universes. There's an infinite number of universes come out from the body of Mahavishnu, and the Lord enters into each of these universes. And then from his own body, he produces perspiration, which forms an ocean in the bottom half of the universe. And then the Lord lays down on that ocean, the Garbhodak ocean. He lays down on the ocean, and then from his navel the lotus flower comes out. And Lord Brahma takes birth there. And then the Lord expands himself further as Shirodakashayi Vishnu. And as Shirodakashayi Vishnu, he is residing in Svetadvip, surrounded by the milk ocean, and at the same time he expands himself into the hearts of all living entities as a super soul. So these are the three Purusha avatars in the creation. We want to understand that these three avatars, they are all expansions coming from, the, from Lord Krishna. Right? So because Krishna is the source of all incarnations. In this chapter we'll hear Purusha avatars, they also have their origin in Lord Krishna. So we do know a lot of people who they accept Vishnu as the Supreme. And we have of course other Sampradayas like the Sri Vaishnavas. They worship Vishnu as the Supreme, as the Personality of Godhead. And they see Krishna as avatar. They have difficulty to understand Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and they simply think Krishna is the avatar. They don't actually agree with us. Anyway, there's some di differences which we have between the Sampradayas. There are other differences, but that's one of the differences. We want to understand these things. We are following Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he has taught us the position of Lord Krishna, how he is the original source of all incarnations, and will be supported here with evidence in this chapter. All right, so the three Purusha avatars are mentioned there in the first five verses. And then the chapter goes on, text 6 to up to 27, and we'll hear about different Leela avatars. There are 22 incarnations mentioned. Actually, there are an infinite number of incarnations, but only 22 are mentioned. Hmm? And at the end of the 22, after mentioning the names of 22 incarnations, then in the 28th verse, then you have this, uh, this uh, Paribhasya Sutra, or the, what is Jiva Goswami describes as the, the emperor verse, the emperor verse, the verse which is above all others. And it establishes very clearly the position of Lord Krishna as the source of all the avatars. Ete chamsa kalapumsa Krishna tu Bhagavan Swayam. Ete cha amsa. Ete cha amsa. Amsa meaning plenary portions, and kala meaning portions, like 
So like this, Jiva Goswami analyzes the meanings of these different words and he explains to us based on the, this text number 28 in this third chapter that Lord Krishna is the, not just simply the origin of all incarnations but he is the origin of what is the origin of the incarnation. The incarnations generally come, and the universe general, generally they will come from Shirodakashai Vishnu, right? Because he's there at Sweta Dweep, and from him different incarnations will come. But Shirodakashai Vishnu himself, he has his origin in Lord Krishna. So Lord Krishna is the origin of the origin of all the incarnations. He is the, the primal source of all potencies. So that's shown here, Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. Um, by, men, by saying Bhagavan Swayam, the, the term Swayam indicates that he's not just simply Bhagavan, because we, we could also describe others as Bhagavan, but he is Bhagavan Swayam. He's the original Bhagavan. He is the original person from which everything is coming and Brahma and Shiva, they also have their origin in Krishna, right? So uh, that is discussed in text number 28. Prabhupada gives a nice purport there explaining how Krishna is the original Bhagavan. And uh, he mentions about the different qualities of Lord Krishna, for example, and we know from our study of Rupa Goswami's teachings in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu that he has analyzed 64 different qualities. And he has shown that out of 64 qualities, Lord Krishna possesses all 64, but Lord Vishnu can only has 60 out of 64. And Lord Shiva has 55 out of 64, and Lord Brahma and perfect living entities, jivas, they have 50 out of 64. So in this way, he establishes the supreme position of Lord Krishna over everything. And then, that's 28, then 29, verse 29 goes on to describe about the benefit of reciting of the appearances of the Lord. If we will recite in the morning and the evening of the Lord's different pastimes appearing in different incarnations, it will give us liberation from the material existence. And then the chapter goes on to describe the Lord's incarnations to achieve ecstatic love. It talks about uh, First of all, we hear about the universal form and that the universal form is not very important. It's only for very neophyte people who cannot understand the divine form of the Lord. And then it, uh, we hear also about uh, the importance of, or oh, oh, the, oh, the final question of Srimad Bhagavatam, or oh, the final question of the sages was answered that where it's because Lord Krishna departed from the world, so where are the religious principles found? And the answer was given, Srimad Bhagavatam. Hmm. So that's there at the end of the third chapter. Okay, but there's a bit more here. Yeah, so text 40 to 44, Sutta Goswami glorifies the Bhagavatam as the incarnation of Krishna. Right? Srimad Bhagavatam is the literary incarnation of Krishna. And he describes how the Bhagavatam was transferred from Vyasadeva to Sukadeva to himself. So the Srimad Bhagavatam was uh, Vyasadeva's mature contribution. He was empowered by Lord Krishna to write so many books for Vyasadeva himself is an incarnation of the Lord, and he was empowered and he composed the Srimad Bhagavatam and then he gave that knowledge to his son Sukadeva. 
And Sukadeva Goswami then passed it to Sutta Goswami. Because Sutta Goswami was present. When Sukadeva Goswami was speaking Srimad Bhagavatam to Maharaj Parikshit, Maharaj Parikshit was cursed to die, of course. He had seven days to live. And many great personalities all came to hear Sukadeva recite. Srila Vyasadeva came himself. And Narada Muni also came himself. They were all eager to hear Sukadev speak. And Sutta Goswami also came. So later on, Sutta Goswami, after hearing the Bhagavatam, he went back to Naimisharanya and he took over from his father and he spoke there to all the sages in the Naimisharanya forest. And that's where we are in the first canto here, in the second chapter, third chapter. We're hearing Sutta Goswami answer the questions of the sages of Naima Sharanya. Glorifying the Bhagavatam, right? This Bhagavat Purana. Of course that was glorified when, when, when they were asked, uh, where are the religious principles to be found now that Lord Krishna is gone? And the reply was given, Krishna Swadamo Pagate, Dharma Jnana Dibisaha, Kalo Nishtam Drishamesha, Puranato Dranodata. That this Bhagavad Purana is, is as brilliant as the sun, and it has arisen just after the departure of Lord Krishna for his own abode. Persons who have lost their vision due to the dense darkness of this age of Kali, will get light from this Purana. So very important, the Srimad Bhagavatam. This is why Srila Prabhupada dedicated so much of his time to writing Srimad Bhagavatam, to presenting it for us. So this is the literary incarnation of Krishna in the Kali, and the religious principles are there in the form of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And we're encouraged at the end of this uh, third chapter, uh, in I think it's text 43 and 44 in the purports there, Srila Prabhupada describes it simply by reading Srimad Bhagavatam. One day you will see Krishna in the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And he also describes what we need to do in order to fix our mind properly to understand this Srimad Bhagavatam. We have to control the mind. And he explains how to control the mind. He says, uh, one cannot steady the mind who is not pure in action. And one cannot be pure in action who is not pure in eating, sleeping, mating and defending. So like that, we have to be pure, we have to give up all uh, nonsense activities, all things which have nothing to do with Krishna consciousness, and we have to fully dedicate ourselves to Krishna consciousness. Then we can actually understand Srimad Bhagavatam. And then Prabhupada concludes that chapter by saying, still, if one in the very beginning is given a chance to hear this message of Srimad Bhagavatam from a representative of Sutta Goswami, then in time he will see Krishna in the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam. All right. So that's the third chapter, the main points. Let's see here. Oh. Uh, oh, we. we want to talk a little bit about this. Uh, if you're going to do these things, we, have to, we should talk about it first. Refute demigod worship, which was discussed in the second chapter, text 23 up to 29. So, you've studied, of course, this. Uh, some, uh, from Bhagavad Gita, you know that the, the, these points have been brought up in the Bhagavad Gita the problems and the defects with demigod worship, right? What's the main problems? Birth, death, old age and disease. Well, can you explain please 
in a more uh, clear manner. Uh, what are you, I'm talking about, I want to know what that's going to do with demigod worship. Could you please explain to me? Maharaj, I just heard the problems. I could not... Huh? Maharaj, I could not hear properly. I just heard the problems and then I thought about this. I am just uh, thinking about the question. Sorry, Maharaj. <laughs> Uh, Maharaj, so basically if uh, we worship the uh, demigod, then we will go back to the locus of demigod or he will be giving this uh, uh, this uh, material wealth and with that we will develop more attachment and it will lead to the suffering. So ultimately we will not be able to come out from the cycle of birth and death. Yes, right. We know that worship of the demigods the results of demigod worship, antavat tu palam tesham, tad bhavati alpa medisham, right? That the results are always limited and temporary. So worshipping demigods will bring us those kind of results. For people who have strong material desires, they will be inclined to demigod worship because quickly they can get results, but the results will be material and they will be limited and temporary. And the, the, real, the actual defect with demigod worship is that it's not going to take us out of the material world. We will have to remain in the material world. As Maharaji said, birth, old age, disease and death. So this is actually the real problem that if we worship demigods, we're not going to solve the problem of life, which is birth and death. So that's a major point in defeating demigod worship. Of course, people may worship demigods such as Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, but they will also not actually be able to take us fully up to the spiritual world. We have to recognize that they are not supreme, that they, are, uh, they themselves are servants of the Supreme Lord. People become confused, they think all the gods are one, all the gods are the same. But there's a difference, there's certainly a difference. Lord Brahma is associated with the mode of passion because he has to do creation. And Lord Shiva is associated with the mode of ignorance because he's involved, he's given the work of destruction at the time of the annihilation of the universe, he's given that task. So he's associated with Tamagun. But Lord Vishnu is in the mode of goodness. And the mode of goodness is certainly recommended over passion and ignorance. So if we by worshipping Lord Vishnu, then we can get real knowledge and we can keep away from the modes of passion and ignorance. And that's important. Many demigods do reflect the modes of passion and ignorance. But those people who want to cultivate goodness, they will engage in the worship of the Supreme Lord Vishnu and his different forms, different names of the Lord, of course Lord Krishna, when we say Lord Vishnu we mean we include also Lord Krishna. So in this way we defeat demigod worship, alright? And then we also talk about an analysis of the various kinds of avatars. So this is mentioned in the first five verses of the third chapter. We did, we did, and if you look in your student manual, you'll see there's also a chart there. Have you seen the chart there? Did you look at the chart? I hope so. I hope so. I hope you saw the chart. Anyway, you can see the different kinds of avatars. Yes, yes, ma'am. All right. We have Purusha avatars. What other kinds of avatars do we have? What are the other kinds of avatars? Lila avatar, Guna avatar, Yuga avatar, Lila avatar, Yuga avatar, and what else? Manu. 
गुणावतार सत्यावेश अवतार मनवंतर अवतार मनवंतर अवतार ओके मनवंतर अवतार ओके They all have their different functions. They're all on the level of what? Are they all Vishnu Tattva? No, they're Moda Passion. Really? Avatars are Moda Passion? Not all, maybe, but few. No, all are Vishnu Tattva. No, my answer. No, some are empowered the Jeevas also. Jeevas Tattva. Yes, some are Shak the the Shaktiya Besha avatars. They are jivas who are empowered, right? Power living entities. Okay, so there are different kinds of avatars. We should understand their merits and their different functions, and they are all empowered from the one supreme Lord. And then, why is Krishna Bhagavan Swayam described in? Text number twenty-eight. That's uh, we talked about that. It, the Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam. So we would like you to somehow pre present some kind of poster like this, uh, and you can give some references to the Sanskrit verses and statements from the purports and analogies from the purports. We would like to hear. From you, students, what we will do? We have three topics, so we'll divide the topics, right? We can have how many people are here in the class? Thirty-three. Hmm? Thirty-three. Okay, thirty-three. So we'll have six six groups. All right, we'll have six groups, and the six groups that means five or five people, or some groups will be six people. And we would like you to first group will take demigod worship, and we'd like to hear you refute it. And then second group will give us an analysis of the different kinds of avatars. You may like to also look in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's in Madhya Lila, chapter 20, where Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is instructing Sanatana Goswami, Sanatana Shiksha. In chapter 20, it begins about text number 170, where he talks about the different kinds of, av different kinds of uh, avatars. Or you can simply use the chart, which is there in the, in the student manual. It's all there in the student handbook. And you can explain the different avatars. All right, in group number three, you have to tell us why Krishna is Bhagavan Swayam. Now, did you get that article I sent a couple of days ago? Did you get that uh, from Krishna Sandarbha by Jiva Goswami? Yes, Maharaj. Did you read it? No? Yes, <laughs> Maharaj. Well, it's, it's, a, it's presented in a readable form. It's taken from Back to Godhead. So it's quite readable. It's not very scholarly. It's not too high. Anyway, you can simply work with Prabhupada's purport, and you can give me information from Prabhupada's purport. Why is Krishna Bhagavan Swayam? Right? So those are the three topics. So we'll have six six groups. Group one and two will do demigod worship. Group three and four, we want to hear about the avatars. And group five and six, Bhagavan Swayam. Why is Krishna Bhagavan Swayam? All right? We, we don't have a lot of time. We'll just give you, what, five, is five minutes enough time for you to do this? Maharaj, can you show the second slide? Which is this one? Maharaj, after group exercises, what all we have to collect? Oh, okay, yeah, right, yeah.
Yes. References to Sanskrit verses, support from Bhagavad Gita, analogies or statements from the purports. Okay, we'll give you ten minutes. All right. So who's making the groups? I'm making, um, oh. like, I'll just do it automatically. Okay. Um, like, I'm sorry, Maharaj, I'm not able to hear your voice. It's not clear. Maharaj, are People are joining. Hare Krishna Prabhu. So what question are we doing? We're doing the the avatars. Right? Yes, sir. We are in which group group four? Huh? Yes, group four. Group four. We're working on the second question, yeah. the avatars. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how how does it get how does it how is it all described? Uh, it's mentioned, actually it was mentioned in the third chapter, the beginning of the third chapter, wasn't it? How there are different parts of the Lord. Was it mentioned there? Yes, the slide, the slide. Uh, I'm just trying to remember where I saw it. Oh, that he mentions also that the vibhutis are also there. Vibhutis are there from the tenth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. So vibhutis are. So we want to have some quotations, some of these different verses. What's a good verse as far as we, to show vibhutis? Directly empowered incarnations, the Kumars, Narada, Pritu, Shesha, Ananta, and indirectly empowered are called Vibhutis. So there's directly empowered incarnations and there's the indirectly empowered who are all the Vibhutis. Right? Vibhutis. You know some Vibhutis from the 10th chapter of Bhagavad Gita? Maharaj, mm. others are not actually unmuted their mics, it looks, looks like. There are three others, okay, no, she has trouble. Oh. There are two, two others, Dilanath Das and Pada Sarthik, they were just saying, I can Unmuted, so far. Okay, so how many of the, everybody take a verse, each one take, we have the first five verses of the third chapter. So each one of you take one verse and come up with points from that verse. All right? Okay. Okay. I'll right. take the first one. Who's taking the first one? Dina Nadas. Me. Okay, who's taking second one? I'll take a second. Thank you, Mary. I'll take number two. Number two. Thank you, Mary Yes. Number three. 
Mesti buat apa? Turn. Nah? Who's taking verse number three? Maraja, I will take two. Number three, yes. Thank you, Maraji. And then number four, who's left? Maybe me. You're four. Yeah. Okay. So, Maraji, third chapter, right? Yeah. Third chapter, uh, third chapter and fourth log, na? Third chapter, yes. fourth log. Yes. Third chapter, right? Fourth log.
tahu. Looks like we are going to come out of the group soon, Maraj. Sorry? There was just a message saying that we're going to be coming out of our groups. Oh, okay. You... Have you got your thing together? Have you read the verse? You got the main points? Oh, okay, good. So I guess we'll each have to do our own verse. I don't know. We just, it's difficult to put it all together. We can each do one verse? Yes, that's better go. Recording in progress. Okay, everyone's back. Everyone's back. Yes. Okay, so let's hear from group number one. They're going to tell us about what? Yes, Maharaj, and I will pronounce Maharaj. So we are going to tell about that uh, the field of um, worship baby birds. Okay. Yes. So as we just discussed about um, why one should not required to do a worship baby god although they if they want they can but that's not required so in the in the uh, purport of uh, 150.27 we can see that Prabhupada is saying that the demi gods are uh, are uh, the servant of lord so as they are uh, duly bound to the supply necessary of the life in the form of water light and air so we can see that demi god are the uh, administrator or servant of lord so whatever, uh, whatever if one person is worshiping demi god and whatever they uh, they are actually uh, one from them, that is they are taken from and uh, demi gods are taken from uh, Krishna and they are given to us. Uh, also, we can see in the uh, 1.3.23 purport that no demi god can release us from uh, or they can deliver us um, apart from the supreme Lord Krishna. Also from Bhagavad Gita 4.12, we see that uh, whoever worship demigod, that is uh, the fruit that is uh, temporary, that is not permanent. So that is restricted to this material world and that increase the bondage which is uh, in this uh, death and life cycle. Also, we just discussed that the, the, the Bhagavan's three guna, uh, guna avatar, um, um, among three guna avatars, uh, Shiva and Brahma, they are also cannot deliver us except Vishnu. So, next, uh, next in Bhagavad Gita 4.12, we see that Krishna, uh, who, uh, those who want to enjoy uh, the, the fruit of their uh, worship to demigods, they actually, uh, they actually worship demigods. Uh, but um, the devotees who worship Krishna, they are not actually uh, desire to have any food uh, apart from seva of, uh, of the Supreme Lord. Also, um, also in the uh, 1.3.28 purport, we can see that um, Prabhupada is saying Krishna is only worshipable. Uh, nobody, no other demigods are required to worship. So, from all this... Uh, from all this point, we can see that um, we don't require to worship Nadine gods. Uh, we should worship Krishna directly. Okay. Thank you. Very nice. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mariji. Yes. Let's hear group number two. So our question is also the same. There are a few demigod worship. So we took some verses from Bhagavad Gita, first was chapter 7, verse number 20. Kama said, Aprahat Gyana, Prabhadyam Gyana, Devita, and Yashila Prabhupada is saying that those who are less intelligent, they basically out of their material desire to surrender onto demigods. 
and that's why they take uh, shelter of demigods. Uh, and also, the Antavattu Kalam Desham Shloka, where it is said, even if they uh, get some benediction from the demigods, uh, those benediction are limited. Because this material world is limited and demigods living here are limited, they also face uh, uh, birth uh, and death. So the benediction given by them is also limited. And uh, the third thing which we took uh, from Bhagavatam is that Bhagavatam is saying that uh, Canto 2, chapter 3, verse number 10, that Akama Sarva Kamo Ga Moksha Kama Udare Ki Kivrena Bhakti Yogena Ejita Pusha Para. Even if you have some desire, don't go to demigods. Just surrender on to the Supreme Personality and your desires, even if you have less desire, many desires or no desire, it will be fulfilled. Simply by taking shelter of Lord Shri Krishna. And again here, uh, uh, in one, uh, there is wonderful an analogy that Shri Prabhupada is giving here that these demigods are just like uh, caretakers. In the sense, uh, Prabhupada uh, gave this analogy that uh, just like a cashier in an institution, he takes care of all the money, but uh, he can't distribute it on his will. So he has to take permission from the authorities. So in the same manner, demigods are taking care of this material world, Varun, they there are so many demigods are taking care of so many things. But um, if they have to give any benediction to their worshipper, they have to take permission from the Supreme Versailles of God because Isha Ganesha says that uh, Isha Vasa Midam Sarvam, everything belongs to Krishna, it is Krishna's property. So in order to uh, avail the facilities or uh, to get uh, some benefit from demigods, they have to refer to Krishna, that Krishna can I give all the benediction to my worshipper. And if Krishna says, okay, you can because you are also my servant and I want that uh, your position remain as a good uh, demigod, so you may give the worshipper the intended benediction. So some points. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Yes, there's quite a few Sanskrit verses there. You were quoting nicely from the scriptures to support your statement. Thank you, Madhuji. Now let's go ahead, group number three. We'll hear about the avatars. Yeah, who is the spokesman? Hare Krishna Maharaj, physics and number of instances. Hare Krishna. Uh, respectful of this is all the devotees. We had to discuss about the Purusha avatars from verses one to five of chapter three. So we make a small presentation on that. I would like to share the screen, a quick analysis of such a Okay. What is it, a drawing? Do you have a present? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, we come to know about Purusha avatars in these verses. Lord Krishna expands, I mean, a portion of Lord Krishna expands into Mahavishnu, also known as Karno Dakshaya Vishnu. And from Karno Dakshaya Vishnu comes out the ingredients for material creation known as Mahatattva. Also, the 16 principles of material creation are manifested by him. And from the infinite pores in the body of Karno Dakshaya Vishnu, infinite universes come out. In each of those universes, then his expansion, Garbo Dakshay Vishnu enters and the purpose of Garbo Dakshay Vishnu is that he gives birth to Lord Brahma, he gives birth to the different planetary systems, he is the source of Nidhanam of all the incarnations that come forth and he is the seed of all the incarnations and all the demigods and other living entities are created by his portions and dependent portions. So that was a quick analysis of the Purusha Avatars marriage. Okay, very good. In 10 minutes, you did a very good job. Yes, interesting. Thank you, Miles. All right. Okay, we'll hear from group number four. I was in group number four, and we divided it up in a different way. We, we had five people, so each of us took a verse. So we have the different devotees speak on their verses. All right. Who's, who took the first verse? Hare Krishna Maharaj. So I'll speak on the first verse. Now, uh, the first verse uh, in the 
in the purport of the first verse, uh, Srila Prabhupada mentions that uh, Shri Krishna, Lord Krishna maintains the material universes by extending his plenary expansions. Uh, the first of the expansions is uh, Karno Dakshai Vishnu, who is also known as Mahavishnu. And uh, just with his glance, he impregnates uh, the material sky. Uh, this is also substantiated in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, I think 8.19. Bhuta Grama Sa Evayam Bhutva Bhutva Praliyate Ratri Agame Vyasa Partha Prabhavati Agame. That is, uh, in every day of Brahma, the universe is uh, created, and uh, every night of Brahma, it is uh, destroyed. And the Mahatatva is uh, let loose uh, during the creation, which consists of. Uh, five gross elements and 11 working uh, senses. And uh, it also in the purport, Prabhupada said that the eternally conditioned souls on Nitya Bhatta, uh, because they have the sense of individuality or ahankar, uh, you know, they uh, they are the enjoyed. That is, uh, the living beings are the predominated uh, enjoyer. And the Lord is the only enjoyer. Uh, so whosoever, you know, uh, falls at the, takes the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, uh, he attains uh, the spiritual kingdom. So this basically talks of the creation of the universe by Kandva Dakshai Vishnu and the uh, let loose of the Mahat uh, Tattva. Okay, Prabhu, thank you. Yes, who did, who did verse number two? I did verse number two, Maharaj. My name is Papa Sarashi, Jeeva Desi. So, um, the, the verse number two was a, a, a summary of the three Purusha avatars, the, the, the first ones, Karana Dakashai Vishnu, Driva Dakashai Vishnu, and Shiva Dakashai Vishnu, um, which was summarized previously, previous group. One in the purport, Prabhupada says, one who knows the plenary um, features properly of these Purusha avatars <coughs> is freed from the material condition of birth, old age, disease, and death. And um, he talks about the, um, the power of the Purusha that there can never be a um, anything without a cause, and that the Purusha is the cause of this is the, the point of the Purusha avatars. And you mentioned to go to the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita and Matalila. So I found text 244 and 245, and there Prabhupada is distinguishing or, uh, in the purports the difference between the Purusha avatars and the Leela avatars, where the Purusha avatars are the lords of the universe of creation, and the Leela avatars are the performance of the pastime. So, so to understand the Purusha avatars is to become free from the suffering. Okay, good. Thank you, Meliji. Very nice. Yes, verse number three. In this verse, they are giving the concept of a Virat Rupa, saying universal planetary systems are situated on the extensive body of Purusha. And he has nothing to do with the created material ingredient. Uh, Maharaj in uh, Purpur Rupa is saying that this special Rupa is especially meant for neophytes who can hardly think of transgender form of personality of Godhead. Okay. Thank you, Maharaji. Yes. Verse number four. Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Pranam to all. So, this Shoka. To mention about the uh, like uh, Sahasra Path Bhujanam Adbhutan means there are thousands of uh, arms and uh, Sahasra Murdha. So, what is said in this sloka that uh, there are this, this form of the, uh, of the form Krishna, if the, the devotees with the perfect eyes can only see this uh, the form of Purusha, who has uh, thousands of eyes and legs. So, legs and thighs and arms and this is uh, all extraordinary. And uh, the, the main thing is that if you don't have a uh, uh, spiritual vision, then you cannot perceive anything which is given uh, to the Lord. So, uh, there, is one, there is one sloka in the Bhagavad Gita in the 11th chapter, which is the Lord of says, where it says that. Arjuna saw the universal form with unlimited mouths, unlimited eyes, unlimited wonderful visions. Now this form was decorated with many celestial ornaments. One of all these things, all these things you, you cannot see if you have a divine, divine vision. And to have the vision, you should have a service. 
for that. So unless you are devoted to the Lord, and unless you are whatever you are chanting, you whatever chanting and seeing all those things. So if you don't have have that, then you cannot see the beautiful form of Rasi Krishna. So therefore, uh, this if this if, if the process of uh, experiencing the mundane object, it is more perfect applicable to the matters of accidental. So only with the patience and says Bhagavan last part, only with the patience and perseverance can we realize that the, the, the accidental such matter regarding the absolute truth. So if you should have that divine vision or divine eyes, see all these things which can be uh, can be uh, possible only with the uh, devotional service. So devotional service bhakti is very important in this case. Okay, right. thank, thank you very much, Prabhu. Yes, thank you. And I will just conclude with the fifth verse. In the fifth verse, Srila Prabhupada points out that people try to establish themselves as incarnations, but incarnations of God have to be established on the basis of Shastra. And without the support of Shastra, no one can be an incarnation of God. And the Prabhupada then talks in detail about some different avatars like the Manus, and he said, he, Prabhupada does a calculation for one lifetime of Brahma, and he shows that in one lifetime of Brahma, you have 504,000 Manus. So that's one universe. One universe has half a million, more than half a million Manus, and there's an infinite number of universes. So just imagine how many Manus there are. Man, Manvantaras, there's so many of them. Uh, and then Prabhupada also uh, talks about uh, there's directly empowered avatars and indirectly empowered. So directly empowered incarnations are like the Kumaras, Narada Muni, Prithu Maharaj, Anantashesha, and the indirectly empowered in avatars, that is Vibhutis, which are mentioned in the 10th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Krishna describes his, vibhut, vibhut, his vibhutis. Of flowing rivers, I am the Ganges. Of mountains, I am Meru. Of immovable things, I am the Himalayas. Uh, 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 I am the light, and, and I am the syllable Om in the Vedic mantra, the light of the sun and the moon, the intelligence of man. And so many different vibhutis are mentioned there in the 10th chapter. So this is these are also, this is indirect empowerment from Lord Krishna. So, this is from the fifth verse. All right, we'll go ahead. Let's hear group number five. They were discussing about Krishna at Swayam Bhagavan. Hare Krishna Maharaj. I'm representing my group, group number five. So, we discussed about the Krishna being the Swayam Bhagavan, which is, which is mentioned into the first verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam that starts with Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So the first prayers are said to the, are, uh, given to the Bhagavan, which is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And the other references we had was from the Bhagavad Gita verse 14.4, Sara Yonishu Kamtaya Murtaya, that understood that the, all the species of life come from him, it's possible through him because he's the seed given father. And uh, from the verse 10.8, the Chatur Shlokis of the Bhagavad Gita, Aham Sarvasya Prabhava, where Krishna himself says that I'm the supreme absolute truth, the source of all spatial and material worlds. And Arjuna himself in the uh, 10th chapter, verse 12 and 13 mentions that you are the supreme Brahman, the ultimate absolute truth, and you are the primal God. Uh, from the purport, we discovered that... Uh, that the 64 principal attributes that the Krishna is the summon Bowman and he is one without a second. And in terms of the analogies from the purport, originally the Lord is full of all opulences, like uh, all powers, all fame, beauty, all knowledge, and all renunciation. When they are partly manifested to the plenary portions, it should be understood that they are there for certain uh, powers and particular functions. But when in the room, small electric bulbs were displayed, it doesn't mean that the electric powerhouse is limited by the small bulb. The same bulb house can illuminate the large industrial diamonds. As similarly, the incarnations of the Lord display limited powers for a certain period of time. Uh, yes, I think we have, we have covered everything. 
Thank you, okay, thank you, Madhuri. Yeah, that was a nice analogy that you brought there. Brought out the analogy about the so many lights may be there, but it doesn't mean the powerhouse is limited to lights. Okay, very nice. We we could ask a, you know, a question. Sometimes the question comes up that Krishna is an avatar, but he comes himself as an avatar. So he he's the source of the avatars, but he comes also himself. You know, and so this is the, actually a devotee brought this question up to me in the last class. So I can't remember one of the men. Anyway, he asked this question to me in the last class. He said that Krishna's an avatar, but he's the he's the nineteenth avatar, but he's also the origin of all the avatars. So how is it? You know, so Jiva Goswami discusses this. If you read that article which I sent you, which is taken from the Krishna Samhita, and then Jiva Goswami explains it. Okay? So you can all try, if you get a chance, you can read that article. Let's hear group number six. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. So what we decided that we'll make a group presentation. So I'll set the introduction and then other team member will take up. So, uh, uh, as uh, Jeeva Sandarva, Jeeva Goswami says that uh, this 3.28 uh, 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 sloka that is Eta Chamsa Kala Kumsa Krishna to Bhagwan Swam, this comes under uh, Parivasa Sutra. And Parivasa Sutra stands for that, as rightly said, that in previous verses it is said that Krishna is also one of the avatar. But Parivasa Sutra, it supersedes all other statements. So whenever there is a contradiction, then we have to understand, uh, we will take the meaning of Parivasa Sutra and where Krishna at only one place is, uh, it, it, it uh, clearly mentions uh, that Krishna to Bhagwan uh, Swam. So he is the source of uh, uh, of the uh, all all incarnations. Uh, 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 so we have few statements that uh, uh, he has got all the uh, uh, four appliances and. Uh, uh, all the directly and indirectly incarnations are uh, are uh, manifestations of uh, Krishna. So uh, now I will leave it to my other uh, team member to explain about references and uh, the analogies. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Tanvat Pranam. So in the verse 1.3.28, it is explained in the first paragraph that an analogy is given that Krishna is like a powerhouse and different incarnations are like electric bulbs. So powerhouse is supplying the power to the electric bulbs also, but his power is not limited to that only. He can display unlimited power. So similarly, Krishna is the source of all incarnations and incarnations are showing his limited power. In the second paragraph, it is explained more nicely that uh, different incarnations is exhibit different opulences. There it is said that uh, the incarnations of Rama and Dhanvantari displayed his fame. Balram, Mohini and Vaman exhibited his beauty. Tatatriya, Masya, Kumar, Kapil exhibited his transcendental knowledge. Narayan Narayan exhibited renunciation. So in this way different incarnations show different opulence, but Krishna is full in all six opulences. And in the third paragraph it is mentioned that uh, Different incarnation possess some portions of the qualities, but Krishna possesses all 64 qualities. That's why he is the source of all incarnations. He is not the avatar, but he is the avatari. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So Maharaj, uh, I'm from group number six. Please accept my humble questions that all questions to all the devotees. So in Krishna Sandarva, I will speak from some point from Krishna Sandarva. So Srila Shila Jeev Goswami says that there is one way uh, to analyze the text that the opening verse and the last verse should have the same conclusion. So in the first verse, there is said that Jagre Parisham Purusham Bhagwan Mahat Advi. So here the word Bhagwan is used. And the last verse, that is 28th verse of that, that it is said that the Ete Chans Kala Puncha Krishna's to Bhagwan Sam. So Shiloji Gustavi pointed out that for analyzing a text, the opening verse and the last verse of the section should be have the same on the same level. So this is one of the way Shri Lugusami presents. Second, 
Pilaji Goswami say said that uh, the Bhagwan word is you is not used in any Leela Avatar song. It's, it's not used in Mats Avatar, it's not used in other Kalki Avatar, in Buddha Avatar. It's specifically used in this particular verse that shows that uh, uh, that this verse is actually his emperor verse. And uh, one more point uh, Shiraji Goswami uh, analyzed with, with his brilliant scholarship. Uh, Shiraji Goswami said that uh, Ete word itself says that, that that all the avatars and cha that, that the word cha is, says that all different avatars which cannot be mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam because there are millions and millions of avatars. So he said this after this the placing of verse on the 28th number itself is a proof that like uh, Krishna is Bhagavan Sam. Ete and cha concludes the all the avatar that is uh, mentioned before and that, that is discussed before in the actual film. So these three points. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you very much. From Krishna Sandarbha here, <laughs> three quotation, three examples there. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Very good. Uh, Prabhupada explains from Prabhupada explains in the purport in the third paragraph that Swayam word is very important. Swayam word uh, is Lord Krishna has no other source than himself. Uh, and in nowhere it is meant, uh, like Prabhuji said, that nowhere Krishna's uh, other incarnations as, are mentioned as Bhagwan, but only uh, in the first verse and the 28th verse they are, they are mentioned as Bhagwan because of their specific functions. Nowhere are they declared to be the Supreme Personality because they only have this, uh, some specific functions. They are not uh, told as Supreme Personality, only Krishna is told that I am Bhagwan. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Yes. Anybody else? Hare Krishna Mataj Maharaj yes. and all the devotees. Uh, also from Group 6, uh, during our discussion, uh, Prabhu have explained regarding this Jiva uh, Jiva Goswami uh, 6 Adnaba, the reason he gives that the, the verse is connected to the first verse of the uh, chapter 3. And if we uh, see further, the chapter 3, first verse, is actually connected to chapter uh, chapter 2, text 30 to 34, which uh, actually uh, uh, proclaim the supremacy of Vasudev. So in this way, we can also connect it directly to the Eta Chamsa Kalapumsa verse, which also giving the supremacy of uh, Krishna as the uh, Swayam Bhagavan. And another point that from Sikh Samadrabha is that uh, Jasna Maharaj was saying that uh, uh, Krishna was mentioned as an incarnation, but here is Yoga Goswami used the Purva Mimamsa uh, logic. In the logic, he says that uh, uh, when a uh, uh, statement is given later, that is more powerful than the previous statement. So here, it, it was Ete Chamsa Kalapumsa uh, giving us the uh, conclusion that Krishna is the Supreme Person of Godhead. But even though in uh, chapter 2 it was mentioned that he is an incarnation, on the nine incarnation. So, example given by six, uh, Jiva Goswami here says, um, somebody, sometime somebody will ask, give me a glass of water. But then later he said, give me a glass of milk. So, Jiva Goswami explained, the later one is should be accepted, not the first one. So, this is the explanation given in the in the article, Maharaj. Yes, Thank you, Maharaj. very Hare good. Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. <laughs> Very nice, you brought out this point, yeah. <laughs> so these points are all there in that article which we sent you from the Krishna, uh, from the Krishna Sandarbha, from Jiva Goswami, his brilliant thinking. Okay, thank you very much for your participation in that nice exercise. Very nice to hear from all the devotees there. We'll go ahead here. Here's a quote from Srila Prabhupada. In this way, as you have learned from previous verses, many thousands of expansions. We are also expansion, but we are separated expansion, living entities. Swamsha Vibhinamsha. Swamsha, just like my hand is part and parcel of my body, direct expansion. And from the hand, from the hands, 
There are so many hairs. They are also from the hand, just as my head. And from the head, there are so many hairs. So they are also expansion, but they are separated expansion. I can cut my hair, but I cannot cut my throat. <laughs> Prabhupada's example from the first canto, third chapter, verse number 27, from a lecture given in Los Angeles in 1972. <laughs> okay. And here's another uh, statement from Prabhupada about the Purushas. These three Purushas are living in the water, Karana, Garba, and Kira and are the super-soul of everything that be. Karanamai Shai Vishnu is the super-soul of the collective universes. Garbhodaka Shai Vishnu is the super-soul of the collective living beings. And the Shirodaka Shai Vishnu is the super-soul of all living entities. From an early, from early essays and articles from Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila, Chapter Two. And here's the diagrammatic presentation of the different avatars, and you can see all the different forms, different avatars are mentioned, and how they originate. And the original form is the Swayam Rupa. On the very top left-hand side, we have the original form of Lord Krishna as a cowherd boy in Vrindavan. So that's the Swayam Rupa, Sri Krishna. And then you have, coming from Krishna, well, you have also uh, Swayam Prakash, which is his own manifestation. And there are two different kinds of Prakash. You have the Prabhav Prakash, and you have the Vaibhav Prakash. So Prabhav Prakash is when Krishna expands himself in similar ways. Just like at the time of Rasa Lila, Lord Krishna is dancing with the gopis, and each of the gopis was dancing with Krishna. Krishna expand, expanded himself in identical expansions to dance with each of the gopis. And then similarly also in Dwarka, Lord Krishna ex expanded himself with his 16,100 queens, and they were all identical expansions of Lord Krishna. So that is Prabhav Prakash, and then you have Vaibhav Prakash, where there's some little difference, just like Lord Balaram is shown there. So Lord Balaram is not different from Lord Krishna. Lord Balaram, however, is a white complexion and Krishna's bluish, darkish blue, blue complexion. So that is Vaibhav Prakash, Lord Balaram. And you have also the form of Devaki, uh, Devaki's son, when the Lord appears in the prison house of Kamsa. So you have the Lord appearing there in the prison house of Kamsa. That is also uh, Vaibhav Prakash, that is Lord Krishna, sometimes he's there, he has a forearm form when he appeared initially, and then at the request of the father, Vasudeva, he changed into a two-arm form. So this was a, a, this was a special feature of Lord Krishna. And then you have Tad Ek Atma Rupa, which is expansions with different moods and bodily features. So you can see in the diagram, we've shown some, there is a Vrasa, forearm Vishnu forms, or oh, Vilasa, Vilasa, Prabhav Vilasa, Vaibhav Vilasa, <laughs> there's so many different variations from the Vilasa, you get the chapter of Yuha, where you have Sankarshan, Aniruddha, Prajumna, and Vasudeva, and that's the chapter of you, but then they, there's many expansions come from them. So they all have different names. And then we show also the Swamsha 
partial manifestations of the Lord. So the Shwamsha avatars are all mentioned, Leela avatars, right? Leela avatars, for example, we have Lord Ramachandra, he's a Leela avatar. Lord Nishingadev is a Leela avatar. Matsya, Kurma, they're all Leela avatars. And then you have Purush avatars, we talked about them a lot, the three Purushas. And then we have also Guna avatars, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. And then you have also Shaktavesha avatars. And you have, it's mentioned there's, up, there's a indirect, and I, I talked about that, direct and indirect. The indirect are the Vibhutis, mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, 10th chapter. And the direct avatars are also mentioned. They're different incarnations like Bra uh, the four Kumaras and Narada and Maharaj Prithu. Then the Manvantaras, I spoke about them. Yuga avatars we didn't speak about. Every yuga there's an avatar. So Kali Yuga avatar, we have Chaitanya Mahaprabhu comes in the Kali Yuga to perform Harinam Sankirtan. It's mentioned in the 11th canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. The, the Yuga avatars have different colors. So this is a review of all the different avatars mentioned there. It's good to know these things. Prabhupada explains, we should be very careful that although there are many thousands and thousands of incarnations of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, still when we have to accept somebody or something as incarnation, we must refer to the Shastra. Then it will be right. Otherwise, we shall be misled. That is being done. So many in the street, in the lanes, there are so many gods, and especially the god, all the gods are going to Western countries. <laughs> and Prabhupada remarked, he said one time when he was coming in the airport, the reporters interviewed him. And they asked him, Swamiji, are you also God? And Prabhupada was shocked. They said, because so many, other, so many Swamiji's, they all come from America and they all tell us they're God. So are you also God? And so then Prabhupada looked at the reporters and he said to them, no, I, I am not God. I am simply a servant of God. But then Prabhupada became even more humble. He said, I am not even a servant of God. I am trying to be a servant of God. So this is how Prabhupada responded to this, that kind of situation. Because so many Mayavadi sannyasis all go to the West and they say they're God. So they're not really God. This was Prabhupada lecturing on first canto, second chapter, text 34 in Vrindavan in 1972. All right, so how is understanding of the demigods, various avatars, Bhagavan Swayam, relevant for us as leaders in ISKCON? So let's stay, remember the groups we were in, you know, let's hear from the, de the devotees who answered this, these questions. How is understanding of the demigods, first of all? How is it relevant for us as leaders? Well, you, you know, we, we could say we're not, I'm not a leader, but just the fact that we're members of ISKCON and you're studying Bhakti Vaibhav, so it means you're not a neophyte, you know, you're already studying Bhakti Vaibhav, so you've been around a while. So how is this relevant in ISKCON for us, that, to have an understanding of the demigods? Could somebody like to answer this question? Maybe people from group one or group two? And it can be people who didn't speak before also? It could be the same person. Who's there in group one, group two? Is it relevant for us as leaders in ISKCON? Do we have to know about this thing? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, Dandak Pranams, I am from Group 2. Yes, Prabhu, good. So, 
uh, and I would like to mention this topic because I think there are there are many times this debate has occurred, you know, uh, especially when it comes to preaching and uh, in in that front when we talk about only Krishna and only Krishna is supreme, you know, uh, we may be very much very well convinced also. But when we talk to the others, you know, especially those who are very neophyte and new into the into bhakti, you know, those who don't know the actual, uh, you know, the details of of uh, of all the incarnations and Krishna is Swayam Bhagwan, they get offended when we say, you know, uh, you are worshiping. So, so what I understand is why it is important or relevant for us as leaders in Iskon or, or whoever is doing the preaching work in Iskon is that we have to be sensitive uh, about uh, about the facts. Uh, and we should um, really, you know, like uh, depending upon the appetite of the others, we should be explaining the facts to them. And when they are getting ready to it, accept, then we should be presenting. So uh, I, I guess uh, the leaders in ISKCON uh, should be well trained on this aspect, and they should be trained also on how to to uh, convey this message convincingly and authoritatively. To the common uh, people or the neophytes or the or the or the non devotees, so that they don't get offended and at the same time, you know, uh, they have the chance to uh, get into Krishna consciousness. This is this is my opinion, Maharaj. And also, there is a top. This topic is also in debatable in many places. Uh, when we see that many devotees in Iskon also still follow demigod worship, where they say that we are just praying to get Krishna bhakti, you know, so we can't give up our uh, our uh, family tradition and family ritual, uh, that is a topic which is kind of debatable or would like to seek more advice on that because we see they are very much initiated devotees but then they do all these things, all these rituals uh, in their family and say that we just pray to get Krishna Bhakti to them. So how to explain them also is uh, very important Maharaj. So if somebody can put that light on that. Mm, thank you Prabhu, it's a very thought-provoking comment. There's a lot of points there to be discussed. Uh, certainly people are worshipping demigods and they're doing it to get Krishna Bhakti. You know, we're not really against it, you know. If, if you go in Govardhan, uh, if you, when we go in Vrindavan, we hear about Sanatana Goswami. And Sanatana Goswami was also very devoted to Lord Shiva. And you can see also from the Brihad Bhagavatamrita, he has a lot of devotion for Lord Shiva. So, Lord, you know, we're not against the worship of the demigods, but we ha they have to be. Their position has to be un properly understood, you know. And certainly, by the blessings of great, powerful devotees like Lord Shiva, who is a power, the greatest Vaishnava, it can be very helpful for our Krishna consciousness. But here, for example, here in Bengal, and I'm staying here in Mayapur, so in Bengal, Bengali people are very much devoted to Mother Durga and Kali and like that. It's very important. And if you see anything to criticize these kind of demigods, then you'll get in big trouble, you know. <laughs> they won't like it. They're very much attached to their demigods. Uh, of course, they don't call them demigods, but they have, they're very much attached to Durga Puja and Kali Puja. These are very big festivals and their worship is done very uh, pompously and big, it's a big event. So we have to be very cautious about how we uh, t touch on the topic, the positions of the demigods. It is a sensitive thing and we should be respectful. We should, we should respect the demigods because they are taking on responsible duties in the universe. They are respons they're, while they're not pure devotees, they are given very big responsibilities in the universe and they have a big position there. So we do have to respect them carefully. Hmm? That's my thoughts on, immediate, my immediate thoughts on your points, Prabhu. Yes, anybody else like to comment more about the demigod worship and uh, relevant for leaders in ISKCON? Hare Krishna Prabhuji, 
So one major challenge which we come across during the preaching exercise, one is this college and university preaching where you have a Saraswati Mata and before any conferences, anything, we have to light the lamp and, and then we have to break coconut and then distribute the prasadam. So as, as a Vastava, it becomes difficult to refuse it also. So what we always preach and follow that we we we, we do the candle or deep lighting, but we accept the prasadam, but we don't eat it because since it has not been offered to uh, uh, the Lord, so we keep it and then we uh, when we come out we give it to somebody else. So this is what we uh, follow it and that's the tradition we follow. Similarly, when we go for village preaching, every village. They have this village uh, uh, god, which is all, always most of the uh, form of devis or, or, or durgas. And since we go for spreading, distributing this Bhagavad Gita and talk about the Vaishnavis, so we have to, we are invited to participate in post puja. So there also we follow more or less the same procedure. And since this whole uh, thing has not been offered, prasadam offered to the Lord, we make some pretext to take the prasadam. We don't refuse them, but subsequently we give it to the cows or uh, something we distribute it to uh, somebody so that the procedure invariably we follow in 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 our uh, uh, group uh, uh, this preaching exercise thank you thank you brother yeah. yeah we should be respectful to the prasadam we don't usually as you say we don't accept the prasadam of the demigods but we do go to visit the temples and that's an, an, a point and you can read in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went, did go to the temples, the different temples, and Manakshi and so on, and Kanyakumari and these different temples. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu visited all these temples. Although we could say there's a demigod temple, but we go there and offer respects. Certainly we should go and respect the demigods, it's not wrong. It's principle of devotees, we offer respects to these different personalities. And we can also pray to them, bless us that I can get devotion to Lord Krishna. Well, another... Uh, Hare, Hare yes, Prabhu, go ahead. Uh, I just want to add one point, because in Malaysia, we, fa we face a lot of uh, obstacles uh, because of uh, wrongly uh, wrong impression given by previous uh, leaders or previous preacher who actually condemn demigod worship and they ask them to remove the, the, uh, the pictures of the demigods from their house altar and things like that Maharaj. so from what i have seen in malaysia uh, one thing that uh, we have to know how actually the sentiment of these people as long as uh, we can add in krishna in their worship that will give them some uh, uh, understanding how to do chanting or follow certain principles and things like that. And also, personally, I have uh, seen one when, when, when I was uh, distributing some books in a shop. Uh, one man was uh, very rudely, he was saying, uh, uh, condemning that uh, we, we don't respect demigod. And uh, because I was having proof parts. Uh, he was saying, no, uh, we shouldn't read these books, all that. So, one point I realized that time is, I told him to, whether he had read Prabhupada's books, is there anywhere in Prabhupada's books he had condemned demigods or any of the devas? So, he couldn't answer me. I told him, you read the book, Prabhupada always have a high respect for the dem demigods, even all the other religion. He never condemned any of them. And what I have said, we... As what Maharaj was saying just now, we have to give full respect to all demigods. They are the servant of Krishna. Uh, we haven't come even to any one portion also uh, to be servant of Krishna in that capacity. And that also will uh, reduce our, I mean, will avoid this offense to the duty of Krishna because all of them are actually the servant of Krishna. I think in uh, Krishna, Krishna, Lila, Krishna Lila, we have seen how even Indra, Brahma, all of them, Krishna put them in certain situations so that we can learn. And at the same time, we also have to give them full respect as a, as a devotee of God Krishna. 
not as a, a powerful person who give us something in return. So that's the only point I think uh, we have to make people understand if we want to uh, penetrate to them about the demigod worship. Because uh, in Malaysia especially, I can see all the Hindus are very, very, even the Chinese also are very, very much sentimental on, on all this worship. So this is uh, uh, what I can say, Maharaj. Thank you, Prabhu. Very yes. interesting comment, yes. I remember also some years ago, there was an issue uh, from uh, uh, distributing back to Godhead in Malaysia. The Malaysia Hindu sang Sangam were very upset because we used the term demigods. They considered the term demigod to be derogatory. They said it's not respectful. We said we should call them devas. <laughs> so in Malaysia, you know, because they worship, they worship these demigods, and they say they're not demigods. These are the devas, you know, <laughs> and they say this, to call them demigods. They're, they're, it's not. They say this is derogatory. This is not nice. You should call. You should give proper respect. You should call them devas. So for some time there was an issue because actually at that time, back to Godhead magazine was doing a series of articles on the demigods. <laughs> so, so the Malaysia Hindu Sangam, they picked up on it, they wrote that and they really didn't like it, they were complaining. And so you have to be very sensitive in different places, how we address these issues. And Prabhupada was always careful about criticizing, he would never criticize a person by name. There was one time actually a sannyasi, a young sannyasi, he criticized a famous, uh, a very famous uh, man from Bengal. And he was, he, he had to run out of the temple. He was attacked, you know, people were so angry at him. So Prabhupada said, you have to be very careful how you address the public. When you speak about people who have the uh, support of the public, if they're respected by the ordinary people, you have to be very careful. We, we should not criticize a person by name. Prabhupada would simply ask, what is his philosophy? And he, then he would explain the defect in the philosophy. But he would never criticize a person by name. Okay, so those are some points about the demigods. Let's go on. But various avatars. How is understanding of various avatars relevant for us in ISKCON? Any comments on this? So, uh, Maharaj, um, like amongst one of the seven purpose of this con, um, one of the main purpose which Prabhupada stays on, it was uh, to propagate the consciousness of Krishna as he is revealed in Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. So, uh, by this we can understand that uh, during the time when Prabhupada was preaching, uh, the message of Bhagavad Gita it was very distorted. And people were misled by various avatars. They were told to worship other avatars, other, and due to which, um, uh, the real message which Prabhupada wanted to spread, the real message of Bhagavad Gita is for this content. So that's why it's important for the leaders of this con. Like as per the question, it's like how does understanding of various of Tar is relevant for us leaders, for us as leaders in this con. So it is relevant because uh, one of the main functions, one, one of the main purpose which Prabhupada wanted was to establish Krishna as a supreme personality, which like, which is established in scriptures. So, um, hence we should have the understanding of various avatars and, you know, how Krishna, as you have also explained, quoting um, uh, Rupa Goswami, that Narayan has 60 qualities, whereas Krishna has 64 qualities, and how Shiva has 65 qualities, uh, and uh, Krishna is a poon rasta, he has 64 qualities. So, it is important for us as well, so that we don't deviate from the philosophy and of, amongst one of the purpose of this con. Yes, thank you, Mariji. Very good. Thank you for that. Anyone else like to contribute to this? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, we told especially for, for ISKCON, because in ISKCON our main uh, customer actually is Hindus. So we should not make them upset uh, to express the demigod worship. So we should not worship demigod, but at the same time we should not upset them. So we should keep our mind always that thing. Okay. Yes, I agree with you, Prabhu. But we finished with demigods. Now we're at the various avatars. Maharaj, could I say, um, yes? when I first joined, 
Um, when I first joined the movement, um, my parents, um, to try and understand what I was doing, they um, enrolled in a transcendental meditation course. And um, the, the person who was giving the course, um, he at some point claimed that he was Krishna. And that he, that he, was, he was saying that he was Krishna. And this was confusing, confusing um, my parents. So when I went to one of the leaders of the, who was visiting at the time, he explained to me that um, the principle that the avatars or the incarnations they have to be um, pointed out. They have to be in the Shastra. They have to be explained in the Shastra. So you go back to that person and say, where does it say that you are um, an avatar of Krishna? Where does it say that you are um, an incarnation? He was saying he was an incarnation of Krishna, sorry. And so um, so this point that you're making about it has to be in the, in the scriptures, this leader was telling me what to, um, how to approach this person who's confusing my parents. So in that way, um, you know, to understand that principle that it has to be, it has to be in the shastra, and you know, determine who's actually bogus and who's, who's these bogus gurus. Mm, okay, good. Yeah, dealing with bogus gurus. Yeah, yes. Yeah, Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. So, Maharaj. So, another thing, what we do that when we are opening the new temples, the local sentiments are also taken into consideration. Like even when you have been uh, opening of this uh, Mumbai Juhu temple, so there are a lot of uh, devotees of uh, uh, Bhagwan Ram Sita. So there, uh, Vigra has also established along with uh, 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 Radha Krishna. Similarly, very recently in. Eastern India, uh, one of the very important city, uh, Patna, where a huge temple has been constructed. And since it's in, uh, Eastern India, they are invariably the uh, very strong devotees of uh, uh, Ram, Lakshman, Sita, Hanuman. So, it, it, uh, so along with the main uh, bigra, there's a bigra of uh, uh, Ram, Lakshman, Sita, Hanuman has also been established. So basically what we always do that uh, depending upon uh, the local sentiments besides this Radha Krishna, there's other Vigra of uh, his incarnations are all, all also established. Like wherever we have a safety and security issues are there, then Narsimha Dev uh, Vigras are uh, uh, prominently established. Otherwise, we, we keep a smaller one. So based on this difference, different uh, locational and sentimental needs to uh, uh, bring the devotees and involve them and these uh, other incarnations are also uh, uh, included besides this Radhe Krishna and uh, uh, this, uh, this Nityanand uh, the, uh, 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 this Vigras Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah, interesting point, uh, considering the local sentiments. I remember when we opened the temple in Andhra Pradesh, in Hyderabad, at that time one of the senior devotees said to Srila Prabhupada, that Srila Prabhupada, he said, uh, the people here are very much devoted to Lord Shiva, but our temple, we just have Gornitai and Radha Madan Mohan and Jagannath Baladev Subhadra. So he said, don't you think we should put a Shiva Linga here? And then uh, then people will all come and they can worship Lord Shiva and then they will also get darshan of our deities. But Prabhupada said, no, you don't have to do that. He said, if we do that, they'll think all the gods are the same. They'll think Shiva, Jagannath, they're all one, all are one, all are God. So Prabhupada didn't want that. He didn't want that we bring in the the demigods, at least that was true in Hyderabad. I have seen recently, I have seen like sometimes, for example, uh, there's one temple we have in Bangladesh, in Dhaka, and it was a Shiva temple originally, but they gave it to us, you know, <laughs> so they gave the temple to us, so we put our deities in and they kept the Shiva deity. And similarly, there's other temples like that, other places we have in India where they've given the land or they give the place and originally the deity of Shiva was there, a Shiva Linga was there. So they just keep it there, it's okay. But it's not given a lot of prominence over the main deities. Just like in uh, in Rajpur, here in Mayapur, at Rajpur where we have the Jagannath deity, 
uh, we have also Sh Lord Shiva is also there, and we have also uh, uh, Simanta Devi. Simanta Devi is also there. Simanta Devi is there because she's involved with the pastime with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, so it's relevant to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes. But generally, we don't promote demigod worship. All right, and then finally, what about Bhagavan Swayam? Understanding ba Bhagavan Swayam as leaders of ISKCON. Any quick comments on this? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, yes, yes, Maharaj. So, uh, our understanding is very important that Krishna is Bhagavan Swayam because this is a very common question we face in ISKCON that why only Krishna? Why do you worship only Krishna and not others? There are so many gods. Why don't you worship them? So once we are clear with the Shastras and with the quotes, Sanskrit quotes, scientifically we can explain to them that Krishna is the only Lord. And second is, uh, there's a very common misconception that Krishna is the avatar of Vishnu. Krishna has come from Vishnu like that. There's a common misconception in India. So that also can be clarified once we are very thorough with the understanding. Uh, and also, like people consider Lord Shiva as God and other demigods. So, uh, this understanding will help in that. To refute impersonalism, also, uh, that Krishna says that uh, Brahman is the so I mean, uh, I am the source of Brahman. So, that also we can explain from Bhagavad Gita. We can refute impersonalism by knowing that uh, Swayam Bhagwan. And uh, uh, lastly, uh, we can explain the difference between the incarnations, demigods, and Bhagwan, if we have this understanding, then we can explain to people what uh, is an incarnation, what is Bhagwan, Swayam, Krishna, and uh, who are the demigods. Because that is also uh, people equate incarnations with demigods, and people equate Krishna with demigods and other incarnations. So this all can be done if we have proper understanding. Mm, yes, good. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. A lot of points. Uh, I, I would like to bring up, though, sometimes people will say, well, there are many scriptures, and different scriptures say different things. You know, you could read scriptures which say Shiva is God. I remember when I was distributing books for the uh, BBT library party, we were distributing sets of books, and oh, it was a long time ago, in the 1970s, and we were taking the books around South India to different temples and so we'd show them the books you know and in the books there are pictures and they would, sometimes there's a picture of uh, Lord, Lord Shiva and he's meditating on Lord Krishna. <laughs> so we showed them the you know they look and they'd see this picture and they say this, this picture is the wrong way around it should be Krishna meditating on Shiva <laughs> you know so Different people have their different understanding, and there's so many different books, and they say different things. It's uh, sometimes it's a challenge for us also to show that the, this uh, Bhagavan Swayam, this is coming from the Srimad Bhagavatam, and it's the Srimad Bhagavatam which is actually the ripened fruit in the in the scriptures, but. There's so many scriptures saying so many different things, and you have to get, you have to get the, the real truth from the, the, the cream of all the Vedas. And so we argue with them on these points. There's a lot of, it's difficult presenting these things. But certainly, devotees in ISKCON, we should know these things and we should be able to present some of these points to the people. We should try our best to present, to help them to understand demigods, avatars and the position of Lord Krishna as Bhagavan Swayam. It's very relevant for us. Okay, here's some points from Srila Prabhupada. We are therefore restricting restricting not to worship any other. Therefore, when I started this mission, many friends advised me, why don't you make it God consciousness? This is bogus. God consciousness, Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, they'll put so many gods. Here is another god. Here is another god. 
here is another incarnation, here is another avatar, all nonsense. Place, place actual who is God, Krishna, to Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. So try to understand our position. Prabhupada's lecturing in Vrindavan in 1972 on Srimad Bhagavatam 1.2.26. Alright, so let's have a look at what we've been talking about today. We've been reviewing chapter 3, the overview of chapter 3. We heard it began with the first five verses about the Purusha avatars and then it went into the Leela avatars and at the end of the Leela avatars then of course we heard about the position of Lord Krishna. Alright, so then we've talked about demigod worship and uh, we've been refuting demigod worship at the same time we're giving proper respect to the demigods but the demigod worship if we worship the demigods independently of lord krishna it's not good it's not proper right and then various kinds of avatars well we've had so many avatars yuga avatars leela avatars guna avatars uh, Shattavesha avatars, vibhutis are also avatars, indirect avatars, and we have also Purusha avatars, different kinds of avatars, all different expansions coming from the one Supreme Lord Krishna. And then we've been talking about why Lord Krishna is Bhagavan Swayam. He is the origin, he's not just avatar, but he is avatari. He is the origin of all the avatars and at the same time he comes himself also as an avatar. He comes himself but he is also the cause, the original source of all the avatars. And then we've been speaking about the relevance of these topics for people in ISKCON, for devotee leaders in ISKCON, this Prabhupada's mood and mission. Certainly we want to represent Prabhupada's mood and mission, we should know. We should know these things, we should be able to present these things. When we're asked, when we're challenged, we should be able to defeat their arguments. And Prabhupada would be very pleased. That's what Prabhupada wanted, that we would represent his teachings nicely to others. All right, so tomorrow we have class again. We're going to go on to talk about the role Prabhupada Srimad Bhagavatam plays in his mission. So we'll be speaking about that. And you can check also here the references, the preface, then 114, 1116 and 125. So there's four places there particularly we want to hear about the role of Srimad Bhagavatam in the mission. And then we will also be talking about different points that we consider especially significant for people in ISKCON and explain why based on the second chapter, verses 12 to 22. This is an important section in the second chapter. We're going to look at the progression which is there in these verses from verse number 12 up to 22 and we'll see the progression and how it's very important for us as devotees in Krishna consciousness. So that's what we want to cover tomorrow. A little bit more from Srila Prabhupada. The appearance and disappearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his different activities are all confidential, even to the Vedic literatures. Yet they are displayed by the Lord to bestow mercy upon the conditioned souls. So, the appearance and disappearance are certainly confidential. 
Uh, we generally we don't find so much about the disappearance of the Lord. That's very confidential. But it's also the appearance is also confidential. Just hearing about the birth of the Lord, how He appears, that people who hear that they, they first of all should have faith. Otherwise, they may simply be offensive. And then Prabhupada continues, we should always take advantage of the narrations of the activities of the Lord, which are meditations on Brahman in the most convenient and palatable form. From the third chapter, text 35, Purpur. All right. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Are there any questions? Is that a hand up, Maharaji? Is it? Hey, Krishna Maharaj, okay. I have a question. Yes, Maharaji, yeah. Go ahead. What's your question, Maharaj? Diksha? Yes, Maharaj. I have a question, Maharaj. Okay. Can you hear me, Maharaj? Yes, I can hear you very well. Go ahead. Hare Krishna. I'm hearing you. Are you not hearing me? Hare Krishna. I think we can hear you. Please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, what's the question? Maharaj, it seems her internet is unstable. So, um, Chaitanya Hari Prabhu has the next question. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, I just want to some clarification on this uh, Prabha Prakash, which from uh, come from Swayam Prakash expansion of Krishna. Uh, because uh, I heard that uh, some explanation, there's a parallel pastime, like for example, in uh, that shows that Krishna is the supreme uh, person, uh, the, the extinction extinction uh, criteria of Krishna is a supreme person, where even when Krishna says, uh, when, when he left uh, Vrindavan to Madhura, uh, he told uh, Vrindavan uh, Vasi, all the Vajabasi, that uh, he will come back. And uh, this explanation was given by Banu Maharaj. He says, even though when Krishna left, uh, we understand that Krishna never come back. But at the same time, uh, it seems that Krishna came back after a few months, and there's a parallel uh, lila where one uh, portion, one of the lila is he is present with all the gopis. Another. At the same time, he's not present if all the gopis Maharaj. This is another criteria which uh, says that Krishna, at the same time, he can be at the two different uh, kind of activity. And another example also when he comes in Dwarka also, uh, there's many aspects that he can, he can be at the two times uh, doing, uh, at the same time, different activity will be exposed to the same set of uh, uh, all the Vajavasis or all his uh, associates. So maybe you can get give me some more explanation on that, Maharaj. Well, certainly we know that Narada Muni went to visit Krishna in his different palaces in Dwarka, and he saw that in different palaces Krishna was engaged in many different activities. That every although Krishna was there in so many palaces. In each palace, he was engaged in different activities. So that was, that was uh, seen by Narada Muni, that he understood how Lord Krishna could expand himself. Now usually the yogis, when they expand, the yogis, they, each expansion will engage the same activity, just like a mirror reflection. But when Krishna expands, each of the expansions can act independently. So Krishna was acting in one one palace. Krishna was uh, talking with his wife, and in another palace, Krishna was playing chess with a friend, and in another palace, Krishna was with the children, 
And so different palaces, Krishna was engaged in many different activities. At the same time. Is, is that your point? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Nice. Thanks, Maharaj. And it's also, it's also described about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that he had his Abhirbhav expansion. He could enter into the body of someone. Then he could actually enter into their body and empower them so that they actually knew everything. Thank you, Yeah, that's thank you. Okay, Madhaji, yes? Is your microphone okay now? Is it Diksha Madhaji? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Yeah. Maharaj, I wanted to ask that uh, Satyu, Satyu, the white color incarnation, what is the name of that incarnation? And then Treta, red color? Well, you can get that information in the 11th canto. If you look in the 11th canto, you'll see there is questions by uh, it, it's Maharaj Nimi and been, uh, uh, he's asking Karabhajana Muni about the incarnations for each age and he, the, he, did, he goes through the four different yugas and he explains the, the names of each incarnation, the color, the color in each yuga and he explains the different names. There are a number of different names there for the Satya Yuga and for the Treta Yuga. They're all there in the 11th canto. I don't Thank you, Maharaj. What is the meaning of Krishna is one without a second? <laughs> one without a second, well, means no one's equal to him. Thank you, Maharaj. And Maharaj, one more question. Why in this con we celebrate so many incarnations? Uh, uh, why do we celebrate? Like we are celebrating for the Leela of Taras. And we don't celebrate for uh, the other avatars. So our Leela avatars is the secondary ones, the one we have to follow. And how should one fix, one should be fixed on Shams on the roof of Krishna, despite there are so many incarnations. So for uh, sometimes for protection, we worship Narsimha. So how to be fixed or should we be fixed or not? We can just be uh, like, how to find our Ishta Dev? Like I sometimes get confused with so many <laughs> well, it's up to you who you want to have your Ishta Dev. Nobody's going to tell you, you know. You have to consider which particular form of the Lord you're most attracted to. It's a question of your heart. You know, you know yourself the feeling of your heart. So you have to consider which avatar, which particular form of the Lord and pastimes you find most attractive. Now, for some people, they're very attracted to Lord Ramachandra because he's such a good, he's ideal son and he's the best, you know, very good husband and like that, you know. And so some people, they like very much Lord Ramachandra and some other people, they're very much attracted to Lord Nishringadev that he's giving protection and he's uh, ferocious to the demons but very kind to his own people. And so it's a question of your heart, you know, who do, which particular form of the Lord are you most inclined to? You know, some people even worship Lord Varaha. Lord Varaha is also quite popular some, in South India. If you like boars, you know, <laughs> he's a transcendental boar. But anyway, the point is, it, it's... It's up to every individual. We don't, we can't tell you who your Istadeva is. It will manifest to you by the heart which form of the Lord you're most attracted to. Now certainly the sweetest form of the Lord is the Shamsundar form. It's a threefold bending form, playing the flute, decorated with a peacock feather, and he's, you know, taking care of the cows. Of course, you may not like it that he has so many gopis. You know, it's just a question of what is the mood of your heart. If you don't mind the competition with all the gopis, then it's all right. But certainly, he's very sweet, Shamsundar, he's all attractive. 
and he is happy in Vrindavan, which is, you know, rural. It's not like living in the city. And Dwarka is opulent, but Vrindavan is sweet. So are you more inclined to the opulent mood of Krishna, or do you like the sweetness? You know, in, in Vrindavan there's a lot of s sweetness. Sweetness. He's with the cowherd boys, you know. You may be a woman just now, but in the spiritual world you may be a cowherd boy. So you could enjoy being with Krishna every day and go out in the forest with Krishna, with the cows, and play with Krishna. You see? And we have, to under, we have to consider which form of the Lord do you find most appealing? Um, why do we have so many avatars and in, what, festivals? We can celebrate all of these. It depends on the res resources of the temple. Prabhupada said every day you can have a festival. Yes, every day you can do it. It's up to, you know, it's just a question of resources and how much time and facilities we have to celebrate all these festivals. But yes, we do like to worship all the Lord's incarnations. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you for your question. Very nice. All right, any other questions? Yes, Maharaj has a question. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, um, as you, like you also mentioned, and it's mentioned that amongst the Guna Avtar, Brahma, Shiv, Vishnu and Shiva are there. So you mentioned that Brahma is in the mode of passion because he has to create. But Maharaj, uh, when we, you know, uh, dive into deep study, we see that even Shiv, in the form of Sadashiv, he's also part of creation. Vishnu is also part of creation. So how can we understand this then? Yes. Yes, it's true. Lord Shiva also plays a part in creation, but the primary focus, you know, Lord Shiva's main service is in the, the end of the, at the time of devastation. But he is active in all phases of creation. He's active in creation, he's active in maintenance, and, but his main focus of service is actually at the time of devastation, at the time of the annihilation, where he will do his dance. So, Lord Shiva is active in that sense. Uh, it's not that Lord Shiva is in the mode of ignorance, but he associates with that mode. And he, he gives a lot of mercy to people like ghosts and so on. You know, generally he resides at the crematorium. And he does do a lot of... Uh, he, he, he's very merciful, you know. He places people who are born in, as goats, he will place them into the, the womb of people who somehow they have, you know, at the wrong time they're ha having children. So he will give them the chance to get a human birth. And so Lord Shiva is doing these kinds of activities. So he's very compassionate, very special. That's why he is... That's why we see Vaishnavam Yata Shambhu, that he's the greatest Vaishnava. But still he, he's not Vishnu Tattva, he's between the material, he's between Vishnu Tattva and Jiva Tattva. Yeah? Shiv Tattva. Yeah. It's considered separate from Vishnu Tattva and Jiva Tattva. Right. So he has... Thank you so much for answering. Okay. All right. Any other questions here? Yes. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Yes, Maharaji. Prabhuji, many a times I noticed and saw that many people are influenced with other avtaras and all the times though in Noida also we have Ram Darbar, Ram Parivar in the temple. So many people visit because of the, there are deities of Ram and Shiva. Sita. And even I noticed that they chant the Maha Mantra by glorifying saying Ram Ram, rather Krishna. So uh, they should be considered as equal to the Vaishnavas or something else. We can differentiate with them because they are all the time very aged and don't have the clear concept that we are glorifying Krishna by they say chanting this Maha Mantra. They have Rama in their mind, in their consciousness. So how can we differentiate 
to we have to differentiate them with the vaishnavas or we have to treat them equally sometimes or i have to clarify them yes we also see them as vaishnavas they're devoted to lord rama and so lord rama is also god he's also mm -hmm. you know he's, his avatar, he, of course, is the expansion coming from Lord Krishna. Mm. Chaita, Chaitanya, <coughs> Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was, he told the uh, Marari Gupta, you know, Marari Gupta was a great devotee of Lord Rama. And Lord Chaitanya told him, you should worship Radha and Krishna, that they're the supreme, they're the supreme Lord. But Marari Gupta told Lord Chaitanya, he said that the next day, he said, I, I, could, I will have to give up my life because you asked me to do it and I can't follow your instruction. But Lord Chaitanya said, no, it's okay, I understand, now you are Hanuman, you must be Hanuman because your mood is like that. And so Lord Chaitanya understood that, you know, some people have the mood, they're devotees of Lord Rama. And so, all right. We, they're also Vaishnavas. They have the mood of being the servant of Lord Ram. And we read Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when he was traveling in South India. Sometimes a Ram Bhakta would bring him to his home, and Lord Ram, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would go there, and he would eat the food cooked by the the Brahmana who was a Ram Bhakta. So certainly Mahaprabhu recognized them as being devotees, as being Vaishnavas. So, and sometimes, you know, people may chant the Ram first in the mantra, yes. Maha Mantra. And so that's how it is in the Vedas. And in the original Vedas, the mantra is like that. And so what I heard, the story I heard uh, from Jaipadaka Swami Maharaj, he told me this. Uh, he said that uh, originally, see, people were complaining to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that you're giving this mantra to everyone to chant. But it's a Vedic mantra. A Vedic mantra should only be chanted by Brahmanas. And if you're not a Brahmana, you shouldn't chant the Vedic mantras. So, you know, people who are not Brahmanas, they would have to go to a Brahmana to hear the Vedas. So they were complaining to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that you're ch chanting this Hare Krishna, Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, everybody. You know, they're all chanting the Vedic mantra. It's not good. So then Lord Chaitanya changed it and he put Krishna first and then he said, now let everybody chant Hare Krishna mantra. Mm. Because it's diff he changed it, he put Krishna first and then Rama. <laughs> so this one explanation, you know. Thank you. Okay. Hare Krishna. Yes, there's another question here. Maharaj, I had a, another question uh, from 1328. Proper writes in the purport that uh, a living a living being can become godly by developing a living being can become godly by developing the 78 transcendental attributes of fullness. But he can never become a god like Shiva, Vishnu, or Krishna. He can become a Brahma in due course. Maharaj, I wanted to ask that here Shiva, Vishnu or Krishna, why uh, they are used simultaneously like Shiva, Vishnu or Krishna. One cannot become that but one can become Brahma. So is Shiva not the demigod or is he higher than Brahma? Like, yes, Shiva is higher than Brahma. Shiva is higher than Brahma. Shiva is between, is between Vishnu and the Jivas. Brahma is a Jiva. We, we can be Brahma. But we cannot be Shiva. We can get the position of Brahma, but we cannot get the position of Shiva. Brahma is a Jiva, but Shiva is not a Jiva. Shiva is higher than the Jiva. Not an ordinary Jiva like us. Shiva is special, right? Between the material, between Vishnu and the living and the ordinary conditioned souls. Shiva is a yogurt, Vishnu is the milk. And so we have to understand the special position of Lord Shiva. That's why Shiva has more qualities than Brahma. Although Shiva takes birth from Brahma in the universe, he takes his birth from, but that's in the universe. But Lord Shiva also has his abode outside of the universe. 
He has his kailash. Kailash is between the material and the spiritual world. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, in Chaitanya Charitamrit Adi Leela, there is one part mentioned that there is a glance in between the material world and the spiritual world. And Shiva, like, I I, am not clear with that concept. That is Shiva the mediator between the between Krishna glancing the material universe? That is the well, point. what I know is that at, at the time of creation, the living entities are impregnated into the material nature and that glance of Vishnu, that is carried by Lord Shiva. The glance of Vishnu is carried by Lord Shiva and he carries the glance of all the living entities to impregnate them into the material nature. Because all the living entities, they go into the body of Mahavishnu at the time of the, you know, the inhalation of Mahavishnu, the end of the life of Brahma, there's a total annihilation and everything enters, Bra Mahavishnu breathes in. So all the living entities who are not pure, they will enter into the body of Mahavishnu. And then when Mahavishnu breathes out, then they come out again. But they come out, the, the, it's a glance of Vishnu, it's a glance and the living entities are impregnated into that glance of Vishnu. And that glance of Vishnu is carried by Lord Shiva into the material nature. This is how Lord Shiva is performing his duties. One of his duties is to do like that. So Maharaj in Bhagavad Gita, there is one statement that Krishna glances on Mother Nature. So, how do we understand this? Yeah, Krishna. The, the material nature moves under, because it, the material nature is described as Krishna's separated energy, separated energy. So Krishna is aloof from it. He's, you know, he's, you know just like, you know, maybe you have a, uh, there's a man and woman and they're separated from each other. And so the relationship is not, you know, very, very nice, not so close, not so intimate. So the same way Krishna looks over the material nature. He doesn't, you know, he, it's his separated energy. It's not very intimate to him. So he glances over it. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, is this another question here? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, is Mahesh Dham uh, also eternal? Is it what? Mahesh Dham, that is uh, Shivji Dham, is that also eternal? Is it eternal? <laughs> yes, it's eternal. Yes. Okay. All right. Seems like questions are finished. So we'll be back tomorrow night. So Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki. Jai. Gorbata Vrinda ki. Jai. Hare Krishna.